I was given very clear instructions. So can you all see that? When I was uh, yes. drawing up this presentation, uh, you're from MPL. We want some Turing. Give yes. us some Turing. So a little bit of Turing you shall have. Um, Hopefully, it won't be too long before we'll be able to start welcoming visitors back onto the MPL site again. We are open, but strictly, strictly for matters that absolutely cannot shut down during the current situation. And a lot of work has been made to make sure the site remain, is, is COVID safe. But hopefully one day we'll be open up as usual again. And in our main reception area, we have quite, they've got a, quite a nice little um, exhibition about metrology, measurement and science, that sort of thing. And of course, we do have a little section that is dedicated to the great man. So uh, um, I assume I assume entry is by a fifty pound note. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you get any change? Yes, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> no, we haven't. We haven't quite reached that stage yet. But um, one of the things that we do have in our little Turing Museum is um, the great man's personnel record, and I don't think GDPR applies to the deceased. So there we are. Uh, so he was uh, hired as a temporary senior scientific officer, which is senior research scientist in today's money. And that's sort of, that's like you're beginning to take the first steps onto mineral management really. So that was, that was actually quite a bargain that we got in for that. Though he got, him, he got promoted pretty quickly, as you can see. So there he was right up until, and there's the Cambridge sabbatical which, as we will all know, came to a pretty abrupt halt when the director, Charles Darwin, found out that uh, Turing had accepted the, post at, um, accepted the post at Manchester. Did he resign? Was he sacked? Was it a bit of both? Does it really matter now anyway? So there we are. So that's, um, that's his personnel card. And there's the other section just giving his um, qualifications, experience. Training again, nothing, out, nothing there that isn't really out in the public domain. And there is the one photograph to which MPL has copyright. What it's, um, it would be interesting to know a little bit more about it. Was that a run in Bushy Park or something? Because uh, as we all know, Turing was a very accomplished athlete. So where he was and what he was doing and what sort of time got there, it would be wonderful to know, but I certainly don't. If anyone else can chip in, that would be good to know. Now, there's no point trying to pretend that he necessarily had the smoothest time or indeed the easiest relationship with the um, founding head of the mathematics department, John Wormersley. So let's just talk a little bit about him. He was the founding superintendent of the mathematics division that is now the data science department. It's gone through various incarnations that I'll talk and cover a little bit about in my talk. But um, Possibly, again, it, it's no secret that Turing never had the greatest regard for him or his technical abilities, but, you know, as David, as David says in his book, uh, Wormersley was not an FRS class mathematician by any means, but he did a really solid job of getting mathematics division established off the ground, and 75 years later, it's still there. So, again, and I think he was, he was also an ex but in uh, mathematical models of blood flow. So sort of the way the um, department is going these days, he could almost step right out of the 1950s straight into the department as it exists today. So that's sort of pretty strong set of achievements for somebody whose own life, sadly, as we can see, was um, cut tragically short. So that's all um, I really have to uh, have in my uh, mini Turing exhibition, apart from my thanks to Sam Gresham and Sarah Clack of our communications team who found those images for me. So that's that's one presentation. So I just need to uh, exit that. And I will then open up the main event. I don't know if anyone's got any thoughts or anything uh, to add to that, but let's, let's jump in with the formal methods. Can you all see that okay? Yeah. Good. So there we are. Could you so, click hide, Keith? Hide. I'll click hide. Thank you. There we are. Okay. What was what was I showing there that I shouldn't have shown you? Oh dear. Looks, I haven't looks, looks fine. Looks fine. It was just a message itself, I think. Okay. Right. That was just annoying. Okay. That was just an annoyance. I was wondering if again. So excuse me. Paranoia. Recording and all that. Okay. So uh, here's here's really here's the um, agenda. I'm just going to talk a little bit about what I hope to uh, get over and hope to achieve with this talk. 
follow with a little bit about the NPL generally, which I'm, I'm sure there's this stuff here that, um, again, you could probably be telling me a lot about some of this historical stuff, and I would very much look forward to hearing about it. We'll go for the tiniest sample of some of our past work. I could be talking for quite a long time. There's plenty of material to fill in numerous talks if I was to drill into, a, drill into too much detail. So I'll just give the tiniest sample. And similarly, I'll talk a little bit about our current work and just draw some conclusions. Again, the very much the emphasis is going to be here on our work, the informal methods, formal aspects, theoretical computer science. So there we are. That's what I'm doing, both historical and current. I'm just going to give some sort of idea of MPL's experiences, what we've been doing, hopefully get some discussion, see, see sort of some of the lessons relevant today. And I'm also going to uh, set the scene for some of our future speakers because some of our um, people working with us, our joint appointments, have very kindly agreed to give us a talk. So we look forward to that. Um, I just really wanted to get over the point that we are still interested in this stuff, as we were saying into the run up to this talk, a language with a properly defined mathematical semantics is just a better language, full stop. It's easier to write better, more trustworthy language in using, so beg your pardon, software in using languages that have that kind of a foundation. So we're still there, we're still interested, but um, to be blunt, the days when we were going to have the sort of expertise that we see with Brian, or Graham Parkin, or people like that, who were the sort of real experts in things like formal aspects, that's not really how we're doing things these days. It's a lot more via links with universities, joint appointments, PhDs. That's, that's really the way we're doing things and it's going to be the way forward. And that's really why engagement with this facts is absolutely key. And one of the reasons I've been able to spend a bit of time getting this presentation ready for you this evening. So I can just engage. It's important. And of course, that's nothing new there. We've been working with facts for years. So about MPL, or oh, about the presentation rather, it's an overview, not going into depth, just a quick tour, ending with some current work. This is not an introduction to formal methods. I will assume some sort of uh, knowledge of formal aspects. If um, that's going to be a problem, speak up and I will let you know. And as I say, this is very, very far from being a complete picture. So MPL, as it is these days, we're looking about 100, 900 staff, 100 staff, slightly more than that, 900 staff, visiting researchers, we still have our main main uh, main laboratory in Teddington, but I would say a very significant development in recent years is that we are looking very much to becoming more of a UK-wide organisation, and we have hubs up in Strathclyde, Glasgow, and in Huddersfield, and all in particular for data science, we now have a team that's based at Cambridge. Um, it seems to me that that's a substantial change from my day when. Uh, interaction with the universities was um, much more low key. Um, yeah. You had, to, yeah. You had to get a contract from DTI, uh, which required us to work with the university in order to get all the funding worked out. And uh, so we, it didn't work out too well, um, I have to say. Uh, one particular case, we worked with uh, Liverpool University, but Liverpool University's funding came uh, a year after our funding finished, <laughs> which didn't seem very, very good for working together. Yeah, I mean that was that was one thing I've very much seen in my time. I mean, yeah, I mean let's face it, these days two universities have a say in running the place. Yeah, Strathclyde and Surrey are on the board for running the place. So yeah, that is that is very much a development that's come in. Possibly recently, probably it's certainly got a lot stronger in the days when uh, from us ceasing to be uh, government owned contractor operated by Serco. If you explain that, we were civil servants, then we then we were run by um, a private contractor, and now we're back working for the government. And one of the things that they were very much looking to achieve, David Willits, the minister at the time, was wanting to achieve was greater interaction with the universities. That was that was that was very much one yeah. of the um, things he, they're looking to do that. So that that is actually a very big change. I wouldn't see it very I've significant. Um, MPL's position as being halfway between industry and academia, um, getting that balance right, I think, is it very difficult, actually. It's incredibly difficult and still something that we look at these days. But, you know, you're absolutely right. That's where we are. And that's certainly what we work to achieve. So there we are, the pilot ace. I'm sure you've seen that pictures. 
packet switching and of course Donald Davies an absolute uh, an, another giant and absolutely key figure and someone who had a longer and far happier time of it at NPL than Turing did so okay just a few quick words about the data science department which as I say is is the current incarnation of um, Wormersley's mathematics department and really we're all about data we're all about confidence as it says there confidence in the intelligence and effective use of data we're a mixture of mathematicians, computer scientists, statisticians, and we're also uh, we also have quite a few secondees from other departments coming to work for us. Again, that's uh, something that's uh, sort of very moving on from the past, and that's that's actually uh, again something very positive and very important. And joint appointments with Cambridge, Surrey, Strathclyde, and Edinburgh, which was no, I didn't list there, so sorry about that. We have PhD students, a lot of industrial supervision of PhD students. And it is all about collaboration. You can't do say to science without data. We've got to be out there working with those organizations, with the NHS, with the universities, with governments to get that data. So there we are. And of course, as ever, we have extensive interaction with our fellow NMIs. NIST over in the States, National, Me national Measurement Institutes. Do I need to explain what a National Measurement Institute is? Might help if I did. We maintain the UK's um, measurement standards, the UK's SI. I used to explain it before 2019 in terms of that we've got the UK's copy of the kilogram. <laughs> that's, that's a little bit different these days, is it not? I could, I could say that until, uh, until May 2019, we have the UK's copy of the kilogram, although those lumps of metal, those cylinders of metal, they still exist. They're sort of in a semi retired they still have a semi-retired kind of use but if anyone wants to talk about that we'll go over that little bit or happy to do that if we have time so there we are so machine learning that's uh, that uh, you will not be surprised to learn is also a very important topic for us in terms of uh, medical imagery things like that and again if any of our current colleagues are on the line and have anything they wish to add very happy to hear from you Reliable software, trust, tr trust, trustworthy software and algorithms. That is as important to us as it's always been. Hence, we retain the interest in formal aspects. So there we are. And of course, ontologies. Some of you may remember that my uh, ex-colleague, Cliff Brown, came and gave a talk for facts on some of the uh, NPL's work in ontologies. Uh, Cliff has moved on to other things now, but the work on ontologies continues. So there we are. And that's really all I um, wanted to say. I, have, I don't know how we're doing for time here, but um, let's go on. Um, OK, so I thought this would be a nice starting point. It's one of the earliest things was um, Christopher Strachey, Mike Woodger. There was a connection there. And looking at the um, first page of the Milne and Strachey book on denotational semantics, I do not uh, plan to give you a talk on denotational semantics this evening. I would dearly love to, but, you know, I've got to know the limitations and all that. But suffice to say, there is a, an acknowledgement of the National Physical Laboratory assisting with the funding for this work. And as we were saying here, yeah, um, Strach's work on Algol 60 was incredibly important to the lab. And, uh, it is just, and that's for Brian, was, well, you know about that, Brian, and to say if there's anything you wish to add there, I, I think we'd be interested to hear it. But uh, yeah, yeah uh, oddly enough, uh, it was Strachey who gave a talk at Oxford, which got me involved in computing in the first place. Wow, so we'll get to Strachey. Strachey yeah, yeah. to you. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so that's the, uh, so um, I did say this was an incomplete talk. So let's, um, let's jump forward 20 years, shall we? And in the 1990s, uh, I, think, I think it's fair to say, the division was moving away from more of the sort of the pure computer science work, more into uh, standards, supporting the government's role on the definition of standards in IT. Now, it can be absolutely no coincidence that about that time, there was also a BCS working group created on the use of formal methods in standardizing IT that published a report that I haven't managed to get a um, paper copy of yet. And I've wasn't too keen on coughing up 66 quid for a PDF, but there are articles out there and it was, um, this, this clearly, this must have been a key event. I can't believe the two were linked because they, because in, in top of the formal aspects work, um, MPL was also looking at things like tickets. Well, not MPL, I beg your pardon, DTI, might have been MPL as well. 
the um, ticket system that's um, that's used to certify software development, which um, that was a co-creation of the DTI and the Swedish accreditation service. And of course, that scheme has ceased to be part of the DTI, but lives on now as Ticket Plus and MPL still to this day um, has Ticket Plus certification for its um, software development activities. So the standards work in the 90s, again, please, if anyone else has um, stuff they want to add here, I want to hear it, was um, certainly for formal aspects, was really tied around two areas, data security and communications protocols. One area being the message authenticator algorithm created by Donald Davies. Again, so um, some of you out there might well have done some implementation, implementations, implementations and work with this system. It was, um, it was used for securing banking transactions, I believe from uh, the mid eighties to the early 2000s. It was pretty key for that. And as I say, it was uh, the creation of uh, the great Donald Davies. And it also proved to be a very fertile ground for looking at formal aspects. So MPL worked on specifications in VDM, VMSL, Z, and, and interestingly enough, LOTOS which are rather the data definition aspects of LOTOS. I should explain for people who don't know, LOTOS is really all about modeling parallel processes or concurrent processes. I don't forgot my shields on the line, I could have been deleting, but processes which can be had, which can be very useful in aspects of things like the communications protocols. There's also an aspect of it that's to do with data definition. And that was really the side of it that was used for the LOTOS specification. I should add that I've got, I've added various references to this talk. And it was very interesting to see that the reference I've put there is in fact a paper that was written over in France in 2018, referencing some work that was going on in the 90s. So it's good to know there's still interest out there. And then there's also one of the other data security projects, electronic data interchange for administration. Again, there was a, um, that was a very nice piece of work there from Gavin Kelly that was a complete specification in VDMSL of this particular piece of software, which then, he, which then they were able to generate C++. And they were talking about experiences about some of the issues with um, getting the C++ to actually run. It didn't quite work with the, um, what came out of the VDM tools didn't quite uh, work with the compilers at the time. So a little bit of, um, a little bit of uh, tweaking there was necessary. So I've put in a reference if you want to look at that. Um, also, there's communications protocols, which was an actual area of interest to me because um, at the time I joined MPL, I'd spent a little while looking at uh, modeling communications protocols with the calculus of communicating systems, which was interesting. And about that time, MPL was starting to look at modeling communications protocols with LOTOS, the language of temporal ordering specification, a, um, something that had its very much its basis in Milner's work on the calculus of communicating systems. I've del delved into that one into a little bit more detail in an appendix at the end of this talk. So if we get time or if there's interest, we could just spend a little bit, a bit of time in the wonderful world of um, of uh, process calculi and interleaving and protocols and all of that wonderful stuff. There's interest. Okay, and of course, Brian, how can I not mention Brian? Uh, Brian wrote, you wrote a, um, an article on formal methods, which I think pretty much nailed it, wasn't it? The opinion that a powerful tool within its area of application, you know, is that, would that be a fair thing to say, Brian? Uh, yeah, there are problems in this area, I think. Um, one difficulty I always had is that, uh, say, doing um, a proper VDM spec or Z spec or whatever is quite a bit of work. And you've got to convince the people who uh, originate the work that you've captured it correctly. Hmm. And that's, that's, that's not easy to do. Uh, and the other problem um, that in the language area, um, certainly arises the point you raised about um, the compiler not accepting what you've produced from from a formal spec it, getting the formal spec to line up with a, a physical implementation is is not straightforward um, no. and uh, indeed 
even in, with Al Gore 60, um, you know, many years after various work had been done on Al Gore 60, um, some Russians wrote to me about a problem with, I think it was to do with uh, integer to floating point conversion in call by name, uh, which um, to my recollection had not been properly considered at all. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and indeed, I know the compilers um, in that, uh, well, the KDF9 compiler, which I, I knew in some detail, uh, fudged that issue completely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I suppose the we're point is, at least we know these things. It's still got some way to be lined up properly. But I think the important thing is, at least we know these things. These things are being highlighted. Oh, yeah, that's yes, right. Yeah. And that, and that has not. value. So don't get me wrong. Um, the uh, the view that you get through formal methods to try to pin down things is marvellous. Yeah. But that's not, that's, that's not the end of the story. No. That's, so what I was going to uh, say, I was looking at the work on OSI distributed transaction processes. So David Brainer's group and Bronya Skysel did a lot leading this work. And it was that they came up with an actual complete specification of this particular protocol and it, 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 it was in the ISO standard. So uh, I, th I think that's a very, very, very interesting um, case study of the application of formal methods to an actual real world example, getting out there and some of the, some of the issues that they had. As I say, I've, I've, I've drilled into a little bit more details in the appendix, but I don't know how we're doing for time here. But um, so all I've really got here is um, just an overview. Uh, a report was published by Robin Barker and Frank Brady in 1995 that just just gave a very nice overview of the work and some of the issues that were faced so there was um there was a team of three of them that worked for three years i think from 90, 1990 to 1992 they worked on this protocol and it was working on um it was it was created on something that was created from something that was delegated to them by the iso committee uh the details of that i know not but perhaps bronya could tell me and i could tell you one time um and it's interesting, just, just getting back to the point that Brian just raised, as the work progressed, there were problems with the English text of this specification. The mathematical model, the mathematical view, highlighted these things. And uh, they, um, they also noticed that the um, LOTOS type, data typing language was an issue. And they just, well, there we are. It was the biggest problem they faced in um, creating this particular specification. So what's also interesting to note, uh, preparing for this talk, I did a little Googling, and indeed they weren't the only ones noticing that because um, in the 90s, um, Simon Thompson, who, I, um, who I'm sure will be known to many of you, he's come and give, he's gave the Peter Landin talk one day from the University of Kent, published a paper where they were looking at translations from Act 1 to the functional language Miranda. So that was, that's an interesting uh, take on things. Um, but there we are, the benefits from producing a formal specification of standard as it was being produced, because they were, were actually working with a standards developer at the same, at the time this particular standard was being written up. Uh, so lots of ISO committee meetings and things like that. So that, uh, that must have been interesting. Um, so there we are, they were the experts who could explain the protocol. And there were some people who were working hard to create a model of this clarified, create, created the model, clarified the ideas. Marvellous. That's really what it's all about, as far as I'm concerned. So there's the, the um, specification was corrected. It was a better specification. But there we are. And there is one very, very interesting point they raised in, the, um, in their uh, report, in that um, formal methods are all about precise specifications, precision. We want this to be exact. Now, that can be interesting, particularly I've never attended any ISO meetings myself, but in the context of that type of work, sometimes the diplomacy here, you know, sometimes a little bit of creative ambiguity can just help smooth things along. And that can be difficult if you're using a um, formal, <laughs> formal language. So that was um, interesting. Uh, the issue, another issue they have was with the tools which is going to be a key um, point all along. I should have said that uh, one thing I did read about the um, 
the BCS's um, working group, the point they raised right back at the start of all of this is that tools are going to be key. This whole approach will succeed or fail according to the tools. And there, that's where they had some reasonably significant problem with this low cost specifications. It was a large specification, hundreds of process definitions, goodness how many pages. Good, well, I do. I do actually have the spec here, but I, don't, I won't count it for you this evening. It won't be too helpful. But suffice to say, the headline is they struggled with the tools. Even for reading in the spec and getting it to animate, there were difficulties there. So verification was only possible by manual comparison. But that's an, inter but that's an interesting point. And as I say, it's a very nice case study, very nice piece of work. I've got a little, I've got a little bit more detail at the end, but it all depends on timing. How are we doing for timing, Jonathan? Is it all okay? Uh, got the appendix. Yeah, uh, uh, you're doing fine. Okay. You're halfway so, through. Halfway through. Wonderful. So that's actually I've got about halfway through my material as well. So that's marvelous. So um, yeah. So where are we going with all this formal methods? Let's see what's the, uh, the what's out there. What's stopping people using it? So uh, Steve Austin, my colleague, my current colleague, uh, Mr. Empire, and my ex-colleague um, Graham Parkin, they published a they published a survey. They went out there. They actually asked people who interested parties as to what they thought about all of this and came up with a very, very nice report. Prior to um, doing the survey, they also came up with a literature search. So having a look at the report, I think we need to ask ourselves the question. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm still just about managing to live with the denial that the early 90s was actually quite a long time ago now, you know, I have um, quite a few colleagues now who never even existed when I started at MPI, that's all bit. Nice, but anyway, I'm still living in denial, but we do need to ask the question, 30 years later, would a similar survey produce particularly different results? My feeling is probably not. So there were four sections to this report, just an overview, just like the headline um, because of the reports. And then in, in software engineering, so they were looking with industry, industrial um, users or people who might have aspired to use this within industry. They also look at academia. Part three, where they were looking at formal methods in higher education and teaching of formal methods. And I believe that's one area where things have changed significantly and not necessarily for the better. Again, I will, this is something where I can get some feedback for yourselves. And finally, they were just talking about formal methods more generally, including wonderfully a very nice formal definition of how they process the data and created the um, created the report in the first place. So that was wonderful. Formal methods for your report about formal methods. They were thorough, those guys. No messing. So um, this is this is the um, this is the size of the survey. Questionnaires, questionnaires sent out. Fill in your questionnaire and put it back in the prepaid envelope. Those are the days we're talking about, <laughs> which actually weren't that long ago, was it really? Anyhow, so uh, they sent out 800 questionnaires, of which they got over half returned. So that's a pretty good return rate. That number analysed might seem low by today's standards, but again, let's that, face the fact they were opening up envelopes and typing things in. So all replies were read. But I think how it was that any replies that would have radically changed the way the um, the way the report was shaping up would have been included. But anything that wouldn't really have changed much the overview of all that was going on wasn't typed in. But um, so there were some. But so the point being, the picture wouldn't have changed. But. Uh, or else Steve wouldn't necessarily have got repetitive strain injury. Um, there we are. Electronic replies, not too many, but there we are, including some from outside the UK. So that was quite a nice sample. And OK, so which formal methods have you considered using? And perhaps not surprisingly, the winners were BDM and Z, with over half of the people responding interested in both of them. And then again, looking at the um, process calculator, that's the next up with uh, none at all. Then others, others as well, filling in, but, surprise, but not unsurprisingly, Z and VDM were the winners. So what were they using it for? Amazingly, ha -ha, specification wasn't 100%, which is a little bit surprising, is it not? And one other thing that always, a um, bit of a hobby horse of mine with these formal methods, they're a wonderful means of documentation as well. And I don't think that aspect of... Um, 
that aspect of the value of this sort of work in documentation, having a proper formal model of this system means that you understand it properly. And that's, that's something very, very valuable, I think, and that I will be looking at towards the end of this specification. So there we are, what you consider the benefits. Clarify requirements, removes ambiguities, unless you're in a meeting where a little creative ambiguity can be helpful. Errors proof properties. Again, another really important thing about formal methods. You can automatically have the tools that can automatically generate, generate means of being able to uh, prove that your specification is that your specification and your implementation is sound. All of this good stuff that comes with doing things formally just because it's better. There we are. Consider the limitations not readable by the clients, which really sort of builds on the point that Brian's just raised. There we are, some aspects difficult to model, probably still the case if really looking at these, this world of um, GUI software and, and coming up with combinations of clicks that uh, you, would never have, uh, you would never have thought, you know, users doing things like that rather than the days when you were just guiding them through a nice, through a nice menu or something and you could be absolutely sure what people were doing. There we are. Steps can be made in the specification, interesting. Barriers, tools not available. Yep, tools. That's the absolute key thing, is it not? It was then, 30 years ago. Arguably, still is today. Increased costs, interesting, though arguably um, a properly designed better system can in fact de decrease your costs. If you haven't got a vending machine out there that's got a bug in it where the right sequence of presses, you can end up with two chocolate bars or whatever for the price of one like a system we had at MPL for a little while. Button presses always arrived at accidentally, of course, but you know, doing things properly will save you money or doing things rigorously will save you money in the end. There we are, but those were the replies. Formal methods are not mature enough. Again, would that be, uh, would that be uh, still something to say 30 years later? Are there really the sort of the case studies, the maturity, those kinds of things out there? to convince people that this really is the way to go. And there, I'll just add to the point there that we're really getting back to the point that was raised with LOTOS, that was raised with the working group. Key, education. So what are the suggestions? Education, universities to teach formal methods. Sorry, I'm going on about tools again, bit of a hobby horse, but a pretty important one. Case studies, all important stuff. So there we are, research development needed. Really, 30 years ago, but truly, truly, is there anything there that's any different from the situation that we have today? I'll be interested to know your opinions. So next stage, there was the guideline of what this was being taught, um, what was being taught. Okay, 94 questionnaires sent out. 65 all in all, including the return, this in the prepaid envelope and email replies. Interesting to see within academia, there was a little bit more email going on than there was within the industrial users at the time. Okay, 60 replies, because five were duplicates, 57 were teaching formal methods and the other three were thinking about it. Z and VDM being the most popular, again, no surprise there. Uses specification refinement proof. Again, no real, um, no real uh, surprises. But uh, from what I gather from uh, talking to people lecturing these days, um, formal methods aren't really on the agenda at undergraduate level, are they? Uh, that would be interesting to know. But that's my understanding that that's the case, which is a tremendously sad thing. If so. And I wonder if so, I'd be interested to know again what people make of that and what's being done. But that just seems such an incredibly sad thing because I know there was there was a lot of formal methods and functional programming around when I was a student. Oh, for heaven's sake, I was at Kent in the 1980s. How could they not do functional programming in those days? And again, functional programming, big news again, isn't it? Because of this whole world of big data, Scala, all that kind of stuff. Big news. We're interested at MPL. Um, here's another project we were looking at, uh, more recent times now, traceability for computationally intensive metrology. This was um, something we worked on with my colleague, Alistair Forbes, who I absolutely must mention, having not mentioned yet. What do we mean by computationally intensive? Significant use of mathematical software. 
the um, the example they always had in mind was um, what they call coordinate measuring machines, which roughly speaking are devices to take amazingly accurate nanometer, I think. Don't quote me on that. Oh, you recorded me, you have. Um, accurate measurements of objects that might otherwise be very difficult to measure accurately, thinking like turbine blades are usually the classic sort of thing. So you've got this probe that moves around this object, making these various measurements in 3D, takes those measurements and using software, well, comes up with you know the accurate sort of measurements of the system as a whole. Software, absolutely key to this, arguably just as important as the physical construction of the device. Computationally intensive, uh, computationally intensive metrology, heavy use of mathematical software, absolutely key. Traceability, I'll talk about traceability in a minute. So, right, so you've got your mathematics, you've got your mathematical objects, you've got your mathematical thing. What are you looking for? You've got your piece of software. But before you start worrying about that, you want a nice, clear, unambiguous statement of the mathematics that this piece of software is going to be implementing. Or how on earth can you even begin to argue that this software is implementing it properly? Again, purely the mathematics being implemented, not interested in details of how to implement. From that, we can generate um, what you call like reference data sets, having taken our computational aim, we can implement the soft, we can implement it and create reference data sets, reference pairs, you know, or the gold standard, the gold standard for mathematical software data sets that um, are taken to be very much a standard for, for mathematical software. Is if, if this calculation is being performed correctly, it will tally as required to the results in this reference data set. The um, PTB often talk about their golden data sets of Gaussian, 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 Gaussian data that they, um, they are very strict in looking after. So that's really how it works in terms of the tracing project. Uh, worked in terms of the tracing project. You have your computational aim, you have your reference data sets, you have your software that you want to verify is working correctly, and you do it by means of seeing how its calculations for this particular computational aim compare with those of the reference data set. That's really will be the criteria by which this piece of software will pass or fail because a lot of the software that's going on in these um, commercial devices is um, commercially confidential. It's a black box. So how are we gonna test the black box? Answer, standards, almost digital equivalent of standards. Going back to the computational aim, the software, the reference data set, the computational aim. And that's really what we mean about traceability in terms of the context of this project. Again, going back to pre-May uh, 2019, I think it was May, um, when your uh, bag of carrots in the supermarket could ultimately, by local trading standards, things like that, be traceable back to the um, cylind platinum iridium cylinder that we have and still have at MPL. Traceability, sort of an analogy in that regard. So, wait a minute. So while this project was being drawn, on, drawn up, a light bulb must have gone on somewhere. Hang about. We've got a uh, we've got a specification here that's got to be precise. We've got a specification of mathematics using mathematical notation. Are formal methods going to be any help to us here? Let's explore this and have a look. Can this added discipline of writing? A computational aim, again, the document that specifies the maths that ultimately is going to be the traceability for what this piece of software is doing. Well, could formal methods add a bit of discipline that's going to be able to make, make better, make us be able to write better documents, documents that can then be um, uh, analysed with software tools, that sort of thing. So um, we did this again to explain that the days when we had the kind of expertise that we could draw in in the early 90s, we've moved on from that, but we did so, so we, we were interested in the work and we did it in terms of this project by awarding a one year grant to the uh, computing science department at the University of York. Okay, really one year, not much time to do much more than scratch the surface, but that's all we were really looking for. And uh, York did some very nice work for us. We were very, uh, we were very pleased with what they did. 
um, the first thing they had to decide was what language was going to be appropriate. That was the very first thing to do. They looked at various, the, the various um, options. B, I think, was one thing, raised, but in the end, they decided Z. The, uh, because it was closest to the sort of mathematics we were looking to implement. And of course, it's an ISO standard, which uh, being a National Measurement Institute, we love a standard and standards are important for the software tools. That was actually one of the suggestions made in the, um, made in the uh, survey. There should be standards for these um, formal languages so that people can make tools of them or by then Z had indeed become an ISO standard. Um, that's why, so that's the point raised there. Um, I've gone into, de into a little bit of detail with the Z in the appendix. I'm aware of time, so I've, uh, I don't want to skip that or miss out on giving you the joy of any equations to look at, but that's, um, that's some work I've got in an appendix. And if we get a bit of time and people are interested, we can have a look at that. But just our thanks to Andy Galloway and Richard Page, both ex York and uh, Jim Woodcock. Very, very nice piece of work there. We were very pleased with what they did. Um, I'm just going to jump on here quickly and mention a textbook written by an ex colleague who uh, very sadly passed away a few years ago. Um, I'm mentioning it because this book is absolutely terrific. It's a wonderful guide and introduction to formal aspects, theoretical computer science, formal methods. I think just sort of the um, title doesn't really do it justice. It's, it doesn't just talk about BDM and Z. It's got a nice introduction to formal semantics, a really good overview. It genuinely is an introduction. I mean, how many sort of papers and books have you seen, seen out there with, you know, this is an easy introductory introductory book. And then, you know, you sort of can see a first few pages. Yeah, I'm with you there. And then you flick the page. And then obviously the author's lost a bit of patience and away they go. But this one genuinely is a very nice introductory guide. Sadly out of print. So if we do want a textbook out there that's going to engage undergraduates, I would strongly suggest get that book updated and get it out there again. It is an absolutely lovely piece of work. Um, the current, what we're looking at uh, currently, I think we're uh, was okay to, uh, for time, aren't we, Jonathan? Um, uh, I'll just just yeah, sure, scratch the yeah. Thanks, okay, thanks. Um, just going to scratch the surface. I'm not going to talk about any of our work with uh, machine learning and medical imaging and uncertainty and all the wonderful things that are going on there. Again, have a few colleagues on the line if they want to add anything about that and talk about any of that work. Very pleased to hear from them. But we're going to look at something that's more the formal aspects work, the sort of stuff that's going to be of interest to facts. And they're so just making the point there is a lot more going on at the group. Um, do that I'll just put them all out there at the moment so uh, well, I just want to make the point the work in formal methods formal aspects functional languages very important still continues but we uh, largely do so via joint appointments with the universities and two we have currently going at the moment is one with the University of Strathclyde and so uh, Frederick and Connor from Strathclyde are going to be coming to give us a talk in um, June is it July oh, no, I've got the date at the end um on type systems where they're looking at um, look at it, including dimensions within type systems. I've got, a, I've got a couple of slides on that in a minute. And there's one actually quite important point that again, I wish to underline. The work as we do it now must very much have a link to MPL's core mission of metrology. The days when we were doing some really powerful computer science, such as you know, message authentication algorithms, that kind of stuff. Those days have gone. There are other organizations doing that type of work. We're all very much about the metrology, the data, MPL's core mission these days. But still there, trustworthiness, managing complex systems. Still, you know, still very much one of the things that they were undoubtedly thinking about in the 90s. Um, so just a cup, quick cup, give us quick cup. Ah, goodness, a couple of quick slides, sorry there, to um, just to give you some sort of a taste for the work that um, Strathclyde will be presenting. They're looking at um, quantities and units and including them within type systems. 
So there we are. There's an ISO standard with all the base quantities, something even more fundamental than units, not worrying even about the units at this stage, worrying about what you'll be measuring. So there's length, mass, time, thermodynamic texture, temperature, all that sort of stuff. So that's really basic underlying things. And then from that, you build up the dimensions of what you're interested in. So there, there's force in terms of its dimensions, length, mass and time. So building that up. So Connor and Frederick will be talking about how the uh, mathematical entities called free abelian groups, which is something which I'm sure will be uh, something of familiarity to some of yourselves out there. So looking at some of that theory, how you can build up free abelian groups of these base quantities. From that, you then build up the dimensions of the forces, uh, the dimensions of the um, objects that you're interested in, taking that into type system so you can have programming languages that are also dimensionally correct, as well as correct in terms of the types. What are we talking about? Um, I should also add at this stage, I've got some, I, um, I've got some slides at the back that I was provided by Edinburgh, but I'll just mention it now rather than go over some slides. So we're okay for time. We've also got a, another joint appointment with the University of Edinburgh, and they're looking at databases, time stamping in databases, um, the semantics of that, you know, um, being a languages, SQL, being able to do these things a lot more neatly and a lot more reliably than is the case. So uh, again, I, I hope we can, I can ask um, James Cheney to uh, perhaps come and give us a talk and just explain a little bit about the work that um, the joint appointment work that MPL is doing there. So the next thing I want to talk about is something that I'm looking at, and it's something that I actually got into via fax. So that's really just a nice bit of circularity for this talk. And that's model-based systems engineering, because I'm really interesting. My main interest really is getting out there and applying these techniques to MPL software, papers, reports, terrific stuff. Let's also look at applying these, um, applying these um, techniques. And one which I think has a has a pretty good um, bit of some pretty good mileage in there, and is potentially some pretty powerful stuff. And again, if anyone out there we can engage with this, see where this is taking us. Love to hear from you. And that's model based systems engineering, because complex cyber physical systems have always been important to MPL. How are, how is important to computers to MPL? We were building the things when they didn't exist. Digital computers that exist. That is. That's how important they are to us, continues to this day. For example, going back to the kilogram, the, cylinder, care, the care and nurture of the cylinders of metal, incredibly complicated work. You just would not believe the sort of things that have to be or still have to be considered in that. But that's now in terms of the definition we have a now really powerful complex cyber physical system called the Gibble Balance, which I can... Uh, tell you about another day, but suffice to say, for the purpose of this talk, the cylinder has been upgraded to this incredibly complicated combination of hardware and software, result of many person decades of work. Obviously, we're going to be looking at the new generation of these systems. It's going to change within time as the definitions, you know, are updated. We're looking at, we're also looking at the various ways in which uh, the various tools and things that can help us in this task. And one thing that I think has a lot of potential here is model-based systems engineering, UML, SysML, that sort of thing. So we're just having a look at this. I'm working with my colleague um, Harish over in the MPL instrument section, just looking at how we can apply some of these methodologies and some of these tools. Again, looking at some of the software tools, returning to that point, so we're doing that, drawing some conclusions and having a look at some case studies. So firstly, what is model-based systems engineering? Uh, again, I anticipate many of you will know this and be able to give me a talk. But roughly speaking, at some level, normally we look here, a more traditional approach is one that's based on documents. You, you draw up your software quality plan, you write your... You write your um, you write your user requirements, functional requirements that were, that's all, um, 
that's all uh, review, that works through to design, ultimately testing, all that sort of thing. Okay, with model-based systems engineering, we're taking all of that, that's still there, but instead of documents, we got an actual computer model, which can be very helpful if, so for example, something changes in the user requirements, that can all, that can automatically filter through when instead of looking at say a series of standalone documents, you're looking at a model where all these various views are interlinked. That's, uh, that's something that seems like a really, really powerful idea. And again, there are numerous software tools out there to help, quite powerful ones from, uh, from what I've seen so far, um, from freeware such as Papyrus to other, to other tools that need to be purchased. Exactly what tools I think you, uh, you uh, require, I think to some extent depends on your needs. For example, are you looking at animation? But that's the sort of thing we're looking for at this stage. So there we are. There's just the tiniest glimpse into a case study that myself and Harish are working on. We just initially we uh, were trying to look at um, an actual genuine system, but we thought, well, for this stage, just for this initial bit of scratching the surface, what we could do is just come up with a generic a generic calibration system, something that contains a lot of the features, but isn't necessarily something where we're gonna drill down too much into the details because we just wanna have a look at the model-based systems engineering and to see how that can help us. And so initially, even at this stage, we're looking at things like where you um, divide, you can divide these up into packages. From there, you have individual items for user requirements operators use case diagrams, but as you can see, it's at the moment, we, it's good we can, structure, we can structure things in a way that follows our, um, our software, um, software quality plan, because that's how we do things at MPL with software. First thing, you draw up a software quality plan. And these are the sorts of features that you can get in a software quality plan. I don't know if you can see my pointer or not, but user requirements, functional requirements, design, verification, that sort of thing, that's, that's how that's structured. And within that, we're finding we can then, within the user requirements package, start putting in some use case diagrams, start putting in some of these user requirements in a table, build things up that way. That's all looking, that's all looking pretty powerful and pretty, um, something certainly worth continuing exploring in more detail. And so um, that's, I got into certainly the, um, someone who was very helpful at um, getting me started with that was um, our very own Sophia Meacham of Bournemouth University and the Fax Group. So my thanks to Sophia for that. And so again, that's a nice little bit of an example of a bit of engagement with um, the Fax Group that's proved thoughtful, which I think sort of brings me full circle with my talk. Uh, I don't know how we're doing for time, whether we can have a little drill down to some of the um, more um, meaty technical stuff, but it's You've just got time <laughs> to sum up, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Oh, I just about timed it right. Okay, yeah. so techniques for developing fit for purpose software, always been, always been of interest to MPL, always will be trustworthiness. The only difference I would suggest now is between then, between the early days and now, is that there has to be quite a very strong link to MPL's core, um, core mission of metrology. Our work in the formal aspects will continue. We are still interested, but it's going to really be done by universities, which is following on from Brian's work. We can work with a lot more easily these days than we could done in the past. Joint appointments, research excellent grants, PhD students. The only tricky thing is it can be a little difficult to find an audience for this work. That was one of the difficulties we found with the traces, tracing and that the um, metrologists don't always get the computer science aspects of the work and the other way around. So that, that, that can be a little bit tricky. But nonetheless, we plow on. There's work to be done. So that's really the um, overview. And then I've got questions and I've got all sorts of other stuff there, which um, perhaps we can look at a later date and then uh, we'll whiz through this ever so quickly just to show you it's all there because I want to get to the last one there we are so nice nice work with that protocol very very nice work indeed uh, I'm just going through this quickly because there we are the Z again lovely lovely work from York that's the stuff that we're doing with Edinburgh there we are I'll put in a lot of references there and that's what I wanted to show you 
15th of June. 15th of June, Strathclyde, Connor and Frederick from, or Frederick and Connor from Strathclyde will be giving us a talk on some of their joint appointment work where they're looking at type systems, dimensions, free abelian groups, all that sort of wonderful stuff. So that's, um, that's really it without uh, drilling out down into too many other details. Okay, thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you very much, Keith. That's very well timed. <laughs> Good. <laughs> So we have we have time for questions. So uh, I, I guess if you want to unshare your screen and we can all sort of uh, see each other better, okay, that would be good. Yeah, uh, okay. So anyone who's got questions, well, you can either type things in on the chat or you're welcome to unmute yourself if you just want to ask verbally. Uh, I guess I'll just start off by saying yes, there was a, the wonderful uh, NPL formal methods survey 30 years ago. So is that something that MPL could do again to see what the state of play is now? I guess, as you say, especially education has changed a lot. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I think probably just to do this work entirely by ourselves. Um, yeah, but sorry to disappoint you, by the way, Troy. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, um, yeah I, I, I suspect not. I think that maybe that's something that we could provide some input into as a joint sort of effort. Yes, well, with a university, you know, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, universities. Yes. I have a question. Go for it, Brian. Um, I'm, 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 can no, you can hear, hear me? you? Yes, Chef. You can we hear can me? Hear you. You? Okay, right. Yeah. Um, I, I'm very familiar, of course, with the mathematical work that MPL does. <laughs> now, you do there's, a slight, there's a slight problem from the very formal point of view. And that is, one can easily produce a, a VDM spec of what one wants, but then when you implement it, you implement it using floating point arithmetic, and you get into the realm of numerical analysis, of which, of course, MPL is, uh, 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 knows full well and uh, does it properly. But how do you prove you've done it properly? That gap seems to be um, not that significant because people do know how to do it, but you, it's not formal. Hmm. It's different. I mean, uh, I mean, I think that's where things like refinement, I think, can come into it, can't they? I don't know if uh, anyone um, wants well, to add to that. You have, no, you have to mirror forward and backward error analysis, basically. Hmm. Uh, and uh, I don't, that's not trivial. No. I don't think it's that difficult, but it's not trivial. I looked at it when I started, when I as a job to do when I retired, but I couldn't get anybody really interested, so I, I went other ways. That's a shame. That's a big shame. That's an enormous shame because that, that that's a very worthwhile thing to do. Well, I can specify it for a student to do for you. <laughs> 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 uh, so but I'm, too long, I'm too long in the tooth to do that sort of thing these days, I'm afraid. So, Keith, there is some discussion in the chat. So, there's one question, of course, in the 1990s, we had those great tools called a, a pen and a paper. We did. <laughs> so, the so question from Marina asking, are people still using pen and paper to write formal specifications, or is it always done on the computer now? What do you do at NPL? Um, I would say it's still, uh, hmm, that's a good point. I mean, I, I, th I think sketching ideas out on pen and paper to start with, for example, um, uh, that bit of uh, SysML, I should have said that was SysML we were looking at. Um, our initial uh, use cases were indeed sketched out by hand on a piece of paper before right. looking too much at the software, but um, I think I, I think that's a question for our joint appointments now, but I think it's still. I think, I think much. this is from a historical point of view. This is rather embarrassing, I think, potentially. Um, <laughs> you know, Darwin's original ideas were produced in a notebook, and that notebook is absolutely incredible. Okay, but do we have the analogy of a notebook these days? Because you tend to write very scrappy bits of paper and then you put it into a proper paper and then you mm. only have the proper paper you don't have the ideas behind it 
Am I right? Oh. Yeah, I mean, these days they're trying to do things like OneNote and all this Office 365 stuff. I think that's sort of seen as trying to be some sort of an analogy of that. But how far, how well that's working, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I've worked a little bit in industry and they, they were still using notebooks in, in industry in, in a, just a few years ago. More, more I would say, than we do in... Uh, using notebooks. <laughs> yes. No, I mean, real, note, you know, pen and paper notebooks. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Probably I more, more than is used in, uh, in academia that, nowadays, I would say. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's more, you know, it's more formal in that in the. Well, I still use I, I still use wrap, scrap, scrappy bits of paper uh, and a notebook occasionally, uh, mm. but they're not of any, you know, they're scrappy. They're, yeah. they're, you you would have you would have great difficulty understanding them at all because they're not they're not it's not self-contained. It's just notes for something else that's on the screen. You know. Yes, and then do you, what do you do? Do you save them or throw them away? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I have saved them, but I shall throw them away in due course because uh, they're no use. So, when you say that, Troy, Troy might be interested if, <laughs> if, if he's still still there. I mean, I, I still write some things like, you know, I've got sort of spiral bound notebooks. But the, to be honest, looking back on them, they're still like bits of scraps of paper. They're just yeah, yeah, you know, spiral yeah. notebooks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you throw your notebooks away then? Well, no, I've still got quite a lot of them and some of them, Went to Swansea to the archive, so <laughs> some, somebody can look look at them there. And I've still got a few up, up at the top here. Let, let me have a, my archive here. <laughs> well, I actually bought a notebook this morning because uh, of all I got it. Nice to see you. A few. Uh, I, I'm currently uh, living in two places at once, and all my stuff is in the wrong place, <laughs> oh, no terrible. matter which place I'm in. So right. I, I went out and bought a notebook and a pencil and a pencil sharpener and an eraser <laughs> this morning because I do not do mathematics with a pen. I don't understand how you can be in two places at once with lockdown. Um, they're within walking distance of each other oh, and I, I own both of them. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I did get it right, didn't I? What your talk's going to be about? Yep. Uh, so we we do have our speaker yes from for two months hence here frederick or one of are you, are you, are there going to be two speakers is carter going to speak as well frederick or is i don't it just know you? i don't know i don't know yeah. i think i'll be able to um, just right. uh, on and frederick to decide that yeah i so, think we'll split it one way or another yeah. okay well, that, that's fine you, you can do it how, how you wish so so yes just as a brief break we, we've got one, one of our speakers in two months uh next month we've got, also got a talk in fact, we've got, there are two relevant talks. Uh, uh, I've sent out a message on a lot of the mailing lists, including facts. So we've got Mar Marta who's going to be giving a talk on the, uh, uh, the uh, Lo Lovelace lecture, which was going to be a physical talk, but now I think the BCS have realized it has to be online, which is good in the sense that it's now free. So anyone who wants to register for that, you can register free for the uh, 5th of May uh, to listen to to Marta, uh, one of Keith's former colleagues. Uh, well, um, I sat in the corner drinking tea while she spoke to Mike yeah, about non evening semantics. <laughs> well, you were breathing the same air, the same the same uh, virus source. You've shared. The, uh, <laughs> and then we, we've also got a, our own facts talk on the sixth uh, of May. So I'm afraid that's only the day after as well. Uh, which is going to be my, Michael Luchel from uh, uh, University of Dusseldorf, uh, going to be online. It's with FME, Formal Methods Europe, so that's why we're having a, a European speaker. Uh, and he's going to be talking about applying formal methods in industry, especially the uh, B method and the, the railway industry. So hopefully that's going to be interesting. He's an academic, but he's very good at liaising with, with industry. So I think that should be a good talk. So do register for... For all, all of those talks, we've got essentially three facts related talks coming up, two organized by facts. Uh, we're always looking for speakers for uh, later on this year. We still haven't sorted ourselves out. So, anyone who wants to volunteer to give a talk, uh, do get in touch with me by email. I'm, I'm jpbowen at gmail.com if you want to email me. 
Uh, so we're always looking for suggestions. Otherwise, it tends to be just the same old people that uh, we know. So I don't know everybody that I can see in front of me here, but if one of you would like to give a talk uh, to Pax on any anything relating to formal methods, you'd be very welcome to do that. Uh, are there any more messages on the, uh, or, or is any anyone who's got a question that you'd like to ask, please um, just unmute. Can I, can I voice my, my, my question which I've messaged? And Please I've, do. Is it, would it be possible, would it be better, I've got a partial answer, to have expressed some of the trade deals on Brexit in some formal method, methodical way? Um, and someone said, well, it wouldn't have been able to be fudged or whatever. And I said, well, they're now paying the, the price of lots of fudges, that's all. Ooh. You know, is it better to have it reasonably firm so we know where we're at or fudged and we get in a mess, which we're in now? Well, I think we know the reality, but <laughs> what do you think, Keith? <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure MPL could come in and help the government. That's well, the sort of thing you're meant to do, isn't it? Yeah. I, I did... Uh try and get a consortium together to uh, uh, build a um, formally specified ledger system to manage the customs border uh, in Northern Ireland. <laughs> I was going to call it the bog chain. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, that, that, that can be a future talk. It sounds wonderful. <laughs> especially uh, the title. Especially. <laughs> but, I'm afraid uh, I'm leaving yeah. the... Uh, thing at this point Probably okay well, thank you thank you so much brian it's been much appreciated you're, it's you're in very nice to see you and thank thank you for all your insightful extra comments <laughs> most welcome yeah thank you so much that really, remember, really the, very remember the 50 pound note oh yes well, <laughs> i'm gonna buy, buy buy a 50 pound note and frame it is my my plan yeah. thank you so much brian. and any more questions because I, I don't know when Keith is going to get, is the, the uh, security going to come and take you away, Keith? I can't hear any boots, <laughs> yeah. down. Hear any boots down the corridor yet, so I'm probably okay yeah. for a few, for about another okay. five, five minutes or so. Have you stuck Otherwise, into Teddington, your office? Yes, I'm, I'm from the Teddington site, because you see that way I've got a connect network connection with much greater bandwidth than even Richard Branson can provide me in my flat, so... <laughs> They've let me do very that. Reliable. I'm glad to see nobody's dropped out. Even, even I managed to not drop out this time. So, so, so. Yeah, so, yeah, we can still have access to the site, you know, but obviously it's all very strictly controlled and it's got to be for a very good reason because there's work that has to go on here, even at the height of the pandemic, you know, uh, the NHS yes. is still going to need their medical, their medical radioactivity standards. Anyway, I think we'll let, let's declare the formal end of this session. I, we can leave the meeting open for anyone who wants to have a chat. But that, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs>